All right, guys, so we are working on uh, the problem review for the final exam. So uh, this is just going through the uh, answers to the six questions that are on that paper. So uh, the first question uh, describes an arrow being shot from a height of 1.2 meters above the ground uh, at an angle 30 degrees, um, or at a velocity of 30 meters per second at an angle of 20 degrees above the horizontal. So uh, that's what I drew on my picture down here um, where I I had to show a sketch of like this dot representing the arrow and we're firing upward at an angle. Um, and it's again starting above the ground. So um, I just filled in the tables for the information that I knew. So I knew the height that it's going to fall over the entire distance is negative 1.2 meters. Um, I had to do a little bit of trig up here to solve for the x and y uh, components of the initial velocity. So uh, 30 sine of 20 and 30 cosine of 20 will get you the y and x components. So for the y, I got 10.3. X, I got 28.2, and then for gravity, I got negative uh, 9.8. Um, part A asked for how long is it in the air, so that's the total time. Uh, this is a little more challenging of a problem um, because it's not returning to the same level, so like it's starting above the ground and going up and coming down. So these times aren't equal like they would be if it was returning to the same level, so you could like solve for the time up and double it. You could do methods like that. You could solve for the time up and figure out how high it is and then uh, but I just solved um, kind of in reverse. I solved for the velocity in the y uh, at the end, at the very end when it's hitting the ground first. Um, and then I used that velocity to figure out the time. So uh, to solve for the velocity at the end, I used bfy squared equals boy squared plus 2g delta y. Um, when I plugged into that, I got negative 11.4 because it's moving down. And then I used that value in part a um, to solve for t. So uh, bfy equals boy plus gt. Solving for t, I got 2.2 seconds for this uh, projectile motion problem. So it spends 2.21 seconds. Um, then uh, for part B is how far does it travel horizontally, which is delta x. There's only one equation uh, for that, so I'm going to use the 2.21 seconds and the initial velocity of the x, which was 28.2, and solve for the uh, horizontal displacement, uh, which is 62.32. Um, finally, uh, it asks for what's the magnitude and direction of the arrow as it strikes the ground. So it's got an x component, which doesn't change, so that's still 28.2 because the horizontal velocity component is constant. And then the y component, we solved for that here uh, in the beginning. So it's moving downward at negative 11.4 meters per second for that one. Um, so I just did the Pythagorean theorem and solved for the overall velocity, and I got 30.4 meters per second for that when I used those two components in uh, the Pythagorean theorem. And then to solve for the angle, I used the inverse tan of the y over the x. I got 22, point, or 22 degrees or so below the horizontal. So um, that's the projectile motion one that's on the right. Um, problem number two talks about a block on an incline. So a uh, 3.5 kilogram block is at the top of an incline. Uh, the incline has an angle of 30 degrees. Uh, part A wants to know the coefficient of static friction. So I did, drew my uh, free body diagram. Um, so that uh, we have the x direction, which is parallel ramp, and the y direction perpendicular. Um, the mass of the block is 3.5 kilograms, the angle is 30 degrees. So in these forces, we have the normal force, which is from the surface. We have gravity, which is always straight down towards the bottom of the page. And we have the friction force, which is kind of up into the left or going up the incline. So uh, in order for it to stay um, at rest, this friction force going up has to be balanced out by the gravity uh, in the x direction. So um, we've done this situation before, so that gravity going down the ramp has to cancel out uh, the friction going up the ramp. So uh, I just set those two things equal to each other, and then I used the formula. So um, the friction equation, FF equals UN, or UFN, and then for the normal force on a ramp, it's um, mg um, cosine of theta. So remember on the ramp, it's the opposite of what it normally is. So x usually goes with cosine and y usually goes with sine, but for the ramp, they're reversed. So the normal force, which would be in the y component, would be the cosine this time, and the x component is the sine. So um, it's be us times mg cosine theta equals mg sine of theta. Um, we can uh, do some algebra that mgs drop out, divide through by cosine to get tan of theta is equal to u, and uh, us turns out to be 0.577 staying stationary. We had this relationship from uh, last lecture, so um, it might look familiar. Um, in part B, um, you give the box a nudge and it overcomes the static friction and it begins to slide down the ramp, and it tells you the acceleration of the ramp is 2.4 meters per second squared. So 
that's the acceleration of the block as it goes down the ramp. Um, so I just set up a free body diagram for that situation. So we have the gravity in the X, which is pulling it down. We have friction kinetic this time that's going against it. Um, and then uh, MA for the mass um, times the acceleration, that's the net force. So uh, again, we're using kind of the similar kind of ideas. So MG sine theta, that is the uh, force of gravity in the X. That didn't change from this first one. Um, U, MG cosine theta is going to be new because U is different, but um, MG cosine theta is the same. Uh, and then MA. Uh, I did um, uh, a process where I just eliminated M all the way around, so I didn't really need the mass of the block at all. Um, and I'm filling that 2.24 in because it was a little bit needed uh, in the screenshot. So um, when I kept going, I solved um, 9.8 sine of 30 minus the um, 2.24, which is the acceleration. So I took the um, coefficient of friction over the friction force over the right side of the equation. I brought MA over to the left. Uh, and then I divide through by the 9.8 cosine of 30. And when you do that, you get 0.313 for the coefficient of kinetic friction. So it's just, again, using your free body diagram, figuring out the forces um, and setting the net force equal to MA. So you could have written this as a positive and a negative for the force of friction because that's going up the ramp and positive. So that's where I got those signs from. Okay. Um, for problem number three, this is a repeat from a problem that we previously did on another review for the force and energy test. Um, so I, I really just redid this problem because I think it's a good one and, and these types of graphs come up um, on the final, so you should be familiar with it. So it says a particle of mass 0.5 kilograms moves along the x-axis with a potential energy whose dependence on x is shown. So this is our function of u as a function of x. So at different x positions, we have different uh, amounts of energy. So um, it wants you to find the force of the particle, or force on the particle, uh, at these different locations. So at um, x equal to uh, 2 meters, and 5 meters, and 8, and 12 meters. So um, the first thing you need to recognize is that the force is equal to the negative du dx. So if this is u dx, or u as a function of x, the slope of the line, the negative of the slope of the line, is the force. So that's what you want to do. So um, at 2, you're at this point, so there is no slope there, so that's why it's zero. Um, at 5, you're on this line here, so you need to find the slope of that line, and it's the opposite of it. So this line goes from 4 to 12, so that gains 8, and you divide that by the two seconds that go by. Um, so uh, when you do that math, it's going to be um, 8 divided by 2, and then a negative that says negative 4. Similar work um, for 8 seconds, you're at this point, so you want the slope of that line that goes through there. So it starts at 12 and ends at negative 12, so it drops 24 in, uh, it looks like, um, 4 seconds. So negative 24 to by 4 is a negative 6, and then a negative that would get you a positive 6. Uh, at 12, again, uh, you have no slope on that segment of the line, so that's 0. Um, so that's one aspect of these graphs that you need to be familiar with. The other aspect is kind of looking at the energy possibilities and uh, solving for either potential energy or kinetic energy or listing like where it can go between. So in part B, it says if the total energy of the particle is negative 6, so if I just draw a line going across the negative 6, um, we want to say, what are the minimum and maximum positions of the particle? So the minimum position would occur uh, there, and the maximum would occur there. So this looks like it's around 9, um, and this one looks like it's around 15. So uh, that's where I got 9 to 15 for those um, solutions. Um, part C, it says, what are the positions if, uh, so it says, what are these positions if energy is equal to 2 joules? So um, we basically just have to find a new value for the energy. So if I draw the two line over here, uh, and then it looks like, okay, that looks like eight. And that looks like eight. Um, so, and it's a little bit left of eight, because that's eight, so that'd be seven. And then uh, it's a little bit right of 16, so that's 17. So essentially the same skill, just um, working with two joules instead of um, negative six, which was the previous one in part B. So part D says, if the total energy uh, is 16, uh, what are the speeds of positions at uh, 2, 5, 8, and 12? So we have to figure out how much potential energy uh, is there. Um, so the total energy E is um, 16, and at x equal to 2, you would evaluate the um, function or read where what energy value you have for potential at that point. So uh, again, these kind of get repetitive. So um, at uh, 2, you're at 4 for the potential energy. So the total energy is 16, uh, the potential energy is 4, the difference between those would be 12, which is the kinetic, and then it's just using kinetic energy as one half mv squared, uh, 
uh, for each one. So it's kinetic energy is one half of 0.5 dB squared and something like that. So uh, when you did that for that one, you should get 6.9. Again, it's similar kind of ideas. So at five, uh, you're at 12. So it'd be um, D, let me see if I read that again. So five, um, um, I might have made a mistake on that one. But um, let's let's keep going. It's it's really the same kind of work. At at eight, you're at zero. Um, oh, that's six. That's not five. Five is here. So that's where I got big. I'm sorry, I was misspeaking. So this is at five seconds. Um, so that's at eight. So that's where I got eight from. And then sixteen minus eight is eight. And then you solve for b. Similar kind of fashion here. And you get five point seven. Uh, for eight, you're at zero. So it's all kinetic energy. So solve for that. And then for 12, you're down here at negative 12. So it's 16 minus a negative 12 is 28. And then you solve for B. Uh, so, so I didn't misspeak. I just didn't read the graph properly when I was trying to explain it to you guys. All right. So that was um, the uh, third problem. For the fourth problem, uh, you have a block uh, starts up here, and it's going to slide down a ramp uh, where there's no friction. It gets to a horizontal section. It's moving, uh, and then it collides with two and then one and two move together and you're trying to figure out how far they travel across the um, friction full surface. So for part A, uh, it asks for the speed of the system after the collision. So we need to figure out what's the velocity of block one before it runs into block two and then we're going to use, uh, because there's a collision here, we're going to use conservation of momentum. So it's conservation of energy into conservation of momentum. So uh, for the energy relationship, I did this. So the potential energy uh, in the beginning for one equals the kinetic energy at the bottom for one. So um, mgh equals one half mv squared. The m's drop out. You solve for b uh, square root of two gh, and you get seven meters per second. So that's the velocity um, uh, that it's moving at when it gets to the bottom. And then uh, I did conservation of momentum. So the uh, initial momentum total equals the final momentum total. Before they collide, one is the only thing that's moving. After they collide, uh, they both move together at the same vf. So um, if I didn't show this work, but I'll show it now. So it would be um, one times two point or one times seven. Back here and erase that. So one times seven, because the speed at the bot bottom was seven, uh, is equal to one plus two uh, times VF. So you're gonna take seven divided by three um, and you get VF. Um, so that is two point three repeating meters per second. So that is the velocity that they have after the collision. Uh, for part B, it says um, they slide together at a constant speed until they reach the area where there is friction, uh, and that coefficient of friction is 0.5, so that's you. Um, so again, I'm just going to use energy and say, okay, it has kinetic energy as a system, uh, which I don't know, but I can figure out, is equal to the, the change in kinetic energy is equal to the work. So the work done by friction is basically removing all of the kinetic energy and they eventually stop. So um, so it's going to be a negative one half, uh, the total mass, which would be m1 plus m2, and then their velocity uh, when they're moving after they collide, which we just found here. So this would be one half, um, one plus two times 2.3. So that's the kinetic energy. For the work done by friction, work for anything is the force times the displacement times the cosine of the angle that they make. Um, so this is umg. Uh, D is the distance, that's what we're looking for, and then cosine of the angle between. So if I plug in numbers, it'd be 0.5. Uh, the total mass, uh, again, is still 3. Uh, 9.8 is gravity. D is what I'm looking for. And then it's cosine 180 degrees because they're moving to the right, but the friction force goes to the left, so that would be 180. So cosine 180 is negative 1. So um, this would be negative 0.5 times 3 times 9.8. You basically just do algebra, which is what I did here, uh, and I got 0.54 meters is how far it travels um, into that uh, region where it's moving. Okay. Um, part five, uh, or question five, is a uh, simple harmonic oscillator of mass on a spring. Um, and I just drew one period, but it gives you several here uh, to figure out the ideas. So it's starting here at positive three, and it repeats itself when it gets back to positive three. So this time here, four seconds, that's the period of the oscillation. Um, from that, we're going to be able to calculate a lot of different things. Again, with your calculator here, uh, you want to make sure you're in um, radian mode when you're evaluating these functions. 
So the first thing it says is to determine the position, velocity, and acceleration as functions of time. So it's just using uh, the equation uh, x of t is equal to the amplitude times the cosine of 2 pi f uh, t. 2 pi f is also known as omega. So um, that's what I did. So uh, to get the frequency, it's 1 over t, so that's 1 over 4, or 0.25. So 0.25 is the frequency, so it would be 2 pi times 0.25 times t, that's inside the um, parentheses there. And then a is the amplitude, so it goes from 0 to positive 3, so that's going to be positive 3. And that's where it starts. It starts at a positive 3. So that is the initial position. All right? So that's x as a function of t. Um, I just multiplied 2 pi times 0.25, and I got 1.57, because that's easier to work with, because you're going to need that term. Um, for v as a function of t, you're just plugging into negative a omega, and it becomes sine of uh, omega t, and then for a of t, it becomes negative uh, a omega squared uh, cosine of omega t. So um, this number here, this 1.57 stays uh, t, um, it alternates between cosine and sine and back to cosine. And then these numbers out front are just representing negative uh, a omega and negative a omega squared. So, um, so those are the functions with respect to time. Um, 2 pi f is what omega should be equal to. Sorry, I had a mistake there. Um, for part b, it wants to know the spring constant. So uh, what the spring constant for this mass spring oscillator is 2 pi square root of m over k. Uh, so you can uh, solve that for m. So it would be 4 equals 2 pi square root of m over 10. And you're solve. So that's what I did here. Um, when you do this, 4 divided by 2 pi, make sure your 2 pi is in parentheses. And then you're going to square both sides, and then it's m over 10 divided by 10. So you should get 4.05 uh, kilograms for that one if you did it correctly. For part C, it says describe the mass's location, direction of motion, and how the motion is changing at time equal to 10.75 seconds. So I just did 10.75 divided by 4 to kind of figure out how many oscillations it actually goes through. So it goes through 2.6875 oscillations. So two complete oscillations. Uh, so one, two, and then it's a little bit past that. So 0.6875 is um, 0.6875 of a period. So um, I took um, 0.6875 multiplied it by four, um, and that's that's what time I'm at. So I'm at basically 2.75 seconds into the oscillation. So that's somewhere around here. Okay. So um, so that gives me an idea of like okay, uh, if I look at the slope of this line, that's the velocity. So I have a positive velocity. Um, and it's going towards the equilibrium position where it's going the fastest. So it's got the slowest velocity here at uh, the negative amplitude or the positive amplitude. That's where the velocity is equal to zero. And it's increasing up to the maximum velocity. So it's not at the maximum velocity, but it's between zero and the max. So it should be speeding up. So uh, I looked at that as like just on the graph. I also evaluated uh, the function with 10.75 as the number here that I plugged in for all these t's. And I got these values. So I got a negative 1.17, which makes sense because it's somewhere around here, which is around negative 1, so that seems good. Um, I got 4.34 uh, as the velocity. So um, it's it's a slope. It's pretty steep. It's not the steepest point because the max velocity would be that. And then, um, so it's but it's positive, so it's moving right. And then the acceleration is also positive. So when I plugged in, I got positive 2.89. Um, so it's a speeding up. I got a positive velocity and a positive acceleration, so they agree that it speeds up. Right. So that was uh, number five. Again, make sure you're in radian mode for that uh, evaluation part in part C. And I'll plug into this. All right. The last question, number six, uh, is one with a uh, merry-go-round. So it's like the playground equipment. Um, so in this picture, there's a. It looks like a dad holding on to a child that's uh, going around the merry-go-round. Uh, so that's not very safe, but that's what we got in the picture, so I, I made a problem with it. So it says a 22-kilogram child is hanging on to his father uh, while riding a merry-go-round. Uh, it tells you the constant angular speed omega. So omega is equal to 40 revs per second, or I'm sorry, revs per minute. Revs per second would be way too fast. So um, part A says draw a free body diagram. So I did that here, but I just want to point out something. So um, on the child, we got force of gravity going down. Um, the child is moving in a horizontal circle, so 
they're actually, um, like if that's the horizon, the dad, and if you can kind of see this, the kid is not exactly level. So there's a, the force of the dad is kind of up uh, and to the right. So I just call that F10. Um, so um, with that, uh, that's that's sort of my free body diagram. So the, the dad is applying a force upward and to the right. This is the centripetal force, which is the force of the dad and the X. Um, the dad in the Y direction is canceling out the gravity. So that's why the kid is staying in kind of a flat circle here. So boy, that might be his so this is a horizontal circle. It's not kind of, he's not bouncing up and down as expected. So uh, the first thing you need to do is convert from um, rads per minute into rads per second. Be careful with that. Uh, I got 4.19 rads per second. So uh, that was part, or something that's going to be necessary for part uh, B. So part B wants to know what's the centripetal force. So we said the centripetal force works. Sorry about that, had a little technical difficulty. Um, so uh, part B wants to know what's the centripetal force. So the centripetal force um, is equal to FC, uh, and that's um, MV squared over R. So you could use um, that equation there, or you uh, could use this equation, which was on um, the equation sheet from a couple um, Tests ago. So, um, so this omega r, omega squared r, that's just equal to this term solved out. But either way, you could do that. Um, so you could solve for the tangential velocity first, um, or you could use the uh, mv squared or m omega squared r term. I did that because it's a little more direct. So I got the force of the dad in the x direction or the centripetal force to be 869 newtons. Um, for part C, it says what's the tangential speed at this position. So the tangential speed um, is r times omega. So uh, 2.25 times the 4.19 gets you 9.4275 meters per second. So that's how fast the kid uh, is moving. Uh, I had a typo here. This should be D and this should, should be E. Um, so for part D, the dad is actually what's providing. Uh, that should be part C, I think. Yeah, providing. So I switched those again here. Um, dad is providing the centripetal force. Um, in the x direction, his arm pulling inward. Um, and then for the angle, you have to just kind of resolve the two vectors. So you have the horizontal component of the vector and you have the vertical component of the vector, and you want to know what's the angle that that forms. So it's just the tan, inverse tan of the y over the x. So the y is the 256, and we're going to divide that by the x, which is 8. So um, that's it. That's the, the answer here is 13. So um, hopefully that is a decent review for what you're going to need to do um, on your uh, final exams and the problems. Again, suggestions for uh, the final exam problems. Make sure you're just showing your work. Make sure that you get to them. So like I would say do those first. Like go do the problems in the back first. Uh, try to answer those questions the best you can. Um, and then go ahead and, and go back and do the multiple choice afterwards. Um, I think that's a, a better way to approach these types of problems. Anyway, I'll stop there. Um, good luck, and uh, I will see you guys further by.